Okay, stop me if you've heard this joke. <laughs> the policeman pulled over a car for going too slow on the interstate. Yeah, not for going too fast, but for going too slow. He pulled him over. He walked up to the side of the car and he looked in and noticed that the car was occupied by an elderly couple. And so he walked up to the driver's side and he asked the gentleman, he said, Sir, you're going so slow, it's dangerous. Why, you're barely going 20 miles an hour on the interstate. And the elderly man said, Well, that's what the sign says. And he pointed at a sign and the policeman said, No, sir, this is Interstate 20. That's not the speed limit. You've got the signs confused. About that time, the policeman looked through the car at the elderly man's wife, who was bearing the signs of terror. Her eyes were open, her hair was blown back, and she was holding on to the dash. And the policeman said, sir, what's wrong with your wife? He said, I'm not sure. We just got off of Farm to Market Road 177. (laughs) Sometimes life gets a little frantic if you misread the signs. We're talking about some of the great signs in Scripture, the promises of God. And I said that before we begin each message, we would make a declaration. And so I'd like to invite you to declare your belief and appreciation for the promises of God by sitting up straight, putting your shoulders back, fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Now, I want you to say this like you mean it, okay? Here we go. The words are on the screen. We are building our lives on the promises of God. Because His Word is unbreakable, our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain in life, Yes, Lord, we stand upon what you have done for us. We want to be people of the promise, people who build their lives upon your covenants with us. Father, we don't know how much more we can take. Earthquakes, hurricanes, conflict between world leaders, and then there's the personal challenges that many face. And yet, Lord, we determine, we determine today to stand upon the great and precious promises. Reveal them to us and make us strong as a result. Forgive our speaker, Father, his sins are so many. And help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Some time ago, I videotaped a message for our church. We recruited a film crew and went down to the Alamo. We selected a park bench in front of the shrine of Texas Liberty and got to work. We set up the equipment and we got busy. Four workers managed the uh, video and the sight and the sound with lights and camera. We must have looked important because people began to pause and look over the shoulders of the crew. I sat on the park bench trying to collect my thoughts, and I could sense that a crowd was beginning to form. Who is that guy? What are they filming? Finally, one woman's curiosity got the better of her, and she yelled over the shoulders of the crew, Hey, buddy, are you somebody important? (laughs) Not a soul on earth hasn't asked the same, not about a preacher on a park bench, but about themselves. Am I somebody important? It's easy to feel anything but important. When the corporation sees you as a number, when the boyfriend treats you like cattle, when your ex takes your energy or old age takes your dignity, it's easy to feel unimportant. The next time you ask that question, I wonder if I can encourage you to keep in mind this great and precious promise from God in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and verse 26. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, 
so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Embedded in these words is this great promise, and that is God made us to reflect the image of God. God created us to be more like him than anything else he made. Nowhere do we read the words, let us make the ocean in our own image or birds in our likeness. The heavens reflect the glory of God, but heavens do not contain the essence and the image of God. Now, to be clear, no one is a God except in their own delusion. But everyone carries within them some of the communicable attributes of God, love, wisdom, compassion, grace, kindness, a longing for eternity. These are just some of the attributes that set you apart from your pet goldfish or the plants in your garden. We are made in his image, the Bible says, and in his likeness. Now, these words self-define in just a few verses. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, there it is again, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So Seth bore the image and the likeness of his father, Adam. Maybe he had his father's curly hair or his father's dark eyes apart from having a belly button you have to think about that Seth was like Adam in many ways you will have to think about that won't you the same is true of us we take after God in many ways listen there is no exception to this promise every man and woman born or pre-born, rich or poor, urban or rural, is made in the image of God. Now, some people suppress this image, others enhance this image, but all were made in God's image. Sin distorted this image, but it has not destroyed it. Our moral purity has been tainted Our intellect is polluted by foolish ideas. We have fallen prey to the elixir of self-promotion instead of God-promotion. The image of God is sometimes very difficult to discern. But do not think for a moment, do not think for a moment that God has changed his plan or rescinded this promise. He still creates people in his image to bear his likeness and display his glory. The New Testament describes a progressive work of God to shape us into his image as we fellowship with him, as we worship him, as we study his word, as we fellowship with his people, as we obey his commands, as we seek to understand and reflect his character. Something wonderful begins No, someone wonderful begins to emerge. God comes out of us. He comes out of us. In the words that we say, in the patience that we display, in the wisdom that we share, in acts of unanticipated kindness, It is as if God is scrubbing the smudge off of an old coin. And in time, a figure, a face, begins to appear. God's goal is simply this, to rub away anything that is not of God so that the inborn image of God can be seen in us. This was the explanation of the Apostle Paul. He loved to talk about being shaped into the image of God. 
He said in Colossians 3, 9, and 10, you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And then again, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You see, pop psychology is wrong when it tells you to look inside yourself and find your value. And the magazines are wrong when they suggest that you're only as good as you are thin, muscular, pimple-free, or perfumed. The movies mislead you when they tell you and imply that your value increases as your stamina, net worth, or intelligence does. And preachers are wrong when they tell you to measure your spirituality according to your acts of kindness, church attendance, self-discipline, or spirituality. According to the Bible, you are valuable simply because God made you in his image. Period. He cherishes you because you bear a semblance to him. And your greatest assignment in life is to allow him to rub off any smudge that doesn't reflect the image of God and allow him to do the work he longs to do, and that is to shape you into his image. In medieval times, a priest assembled his church for a special service. Come tonight, he told them, and hear a special sermon about Jesus Christ. They came. But to their surprise, the sanctuary was completely dark. No candle was lit. They found their way into the sanctuary and found seats onto the pews, walking through the darkness. They looked around for any sign of life. They did not see the priest, but soon they heard him. He too felt his way through the sanctuary until he reached the very front. And there he lit a candle. And he lifted the candle high enough until it shed a light on the feet of the crucifix that hung on the wall. And for a moment he let the light fall on the pierced feet. And then he lifted the candle higher until the light fell on the pierced side. And then he took the light to the hands that were nailed to the cross. And then as high as he could lift the candle, he let the light fall upon the bloody face of Christ and the crown of thorns. And then he lowered the candle and blew it out. And the sermon was over. That is our assignment, to let our lives shed light upon Jesus Christ. That's our highest call, is to allow the one who lives in us to grow until our very lives cast a light upon Christ. Could I invite you to do something? Would you let this truth, would you let this truth find its way into your heart? You are conceived by God before you were conceived by by your parents. You were loved by God before you were ever thought of by a person. You are not an accident. You are not a fluke of nature. You're not a consequence of evolution. And you are not defined by the number of pounds you weigh, the number of followers you have, the car you drive, or the clothing you wear. CEO or unemployed, doesn't matter. Hot list or not list, doesn't matter. Blue blood or orphaned, doesn't matter. High IQ or low IQ, does not matter. First string or bench warmer, doesn't matter. You are being made in God's image. 
Print that on your resume. Put that on a business card. Put that on your office door. You are a diamond. You are a rose. You are a jewel. And you have been purchased by the blood of Christ. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. In the eyes of God, you are worth dying for. You tell that to the person who looks back at you from the mirror. Let that truth find its way into your heart. Also, would you let this truth define the way you see other people. The Apostle Paul said, our firm decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life. Far better life than people ever lived on their own. Look at this. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. Would you let this truth define the way you see people? Every person you see was created by God to bear his image and deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. This means that all people, all people, deserve to be seen for who they were intended to be, and that is image bearers of God. We live in a hostile, trigger-happy society. We seem to have lost the capability of having an honest disagreement with one another. News broadcasts and talk shows are making a living out of teaching us how to be tacky, disrespectful, arrogant, and mean. I believe that our society is hungry for a quorum of people who will believe what God teaches, and that is every person, even the person with whom you disagree, is a person worthy of dignity and respect. Would you be that person? Would you be the person who this week refuses to put people in pigeonholes? The person who checks you out at the grocery store as a human being. The person who gives you your paycheck is not a source of income. That's a human being. The kid who sits next to you in the class is not just a kid. That's a human being. God's idea. Can you imagine the impact that this promise from Genesis 1 would have upon the society that believed it? Can you imagine the impact this promise would have upon the people who believed that every single person within the boundaries of their borders was shaped by God, dreamed up by God, and is asked to be the image of God? What civility it would engender what kindness it would foster. Racism will not flourish when people believe that their neighbor bears the image of God. The fire of feuds will have no fuel when people believe that, yes, even their adversaries are God's idea. Will a man abuse a woman not if he believes that she bears a divine spark? Will a boss neglect an employee? Not if she believes that every human being deserves to be heard 
and deserves respect. Will society write off the preborn, the indigent, the mentally ill, the elderly, the inmate on death row, the refugee? No, not if we believe, truly believe that every human being is God's idea and he has no bad idea. Steve Goodier tells a great story about a boy named Kevin. He struggled with schoolwork, and what came easier for others came very difficult for him. He had trouble learning his ABCs. He couldn't compete in schoolyard races. But Kevin had a way with people. He had a bright smile and a big heart, and he had a lot of friends. Goodier tells about the time that Kevin's pastor decided that their church should have a kids' or a boys' basketball team and join the church league. Well, Kevin signed up. And he soon became a favorite player on the team. But he had trouble playing basketball. He practiced hard. And while the other boys worked at dribbling and shooting layups, well, Kevin's, all he could do was lunge the ball at the basket. He had a special spot near the free throw line that was reserved just for him. And practice after practice, he threw and threw. And on occasion, the ball would go in and Kevin would raise both of his arms in triumph and he would shout and all the other players would applaud. Can I read just about three paragraphs in the way Goudier describes the final game of the season. At the end of the season, the boys played in the church's league's tournament, the church league's tournament. They hadn't won a game all year. As the last place team, they drew the unfortunate spot of playing against the best team, a team that hadn't lost all year. Game day arrived and both teams played their best, but the game went as expected. Near the end of the last quarter, Kevin's team stood nearly 30 points behind. It was then that one of the boys called a timeout. Coach, he said, this is our last game, and Kevin has never made a basket in a game. I think we should let him make a basket. The team agreed. Kevin was instructed to stand at his place near the free throw line and wait. He was told that he would, he would be given the ball, and when he was, he should shoot. Kevin was ecstatic. He ran to the floor and waited. When the ball was passed to him, he shot and missed. Number 17 from the other team snatched the rebound, dribbled down the court, and made an easy basket. But a moment later, Kevin got the ball again. He shot and missed again. Number 17 repeated his performance, scoring two more points. Kevin shot a third and a fourth time with the same result. But slowly, the other team seemed to figure out what was going on. And the next time they snatched the rebound, a boy threw the ball to Kevin. He shot and missed. Now every rebound came to him, and he threw and threw toward the basket. Time was running down, and Kevin still had not scored. Both teams circled the boy by this time, and all of the players were shouting, Kevin, Kevin. The crowd took up the chant. Soon everyone in the gym was shouting Kevin's name. The coach was sure that time must have run out. The game had to be over. He glanced at the official clock. It stopped, and it was stopped at 4.3 seconds. Even the timekeepers joined the mania and stood by the table shouting with the crowd, Kevin, Kevin. Kevin shot and shot, and finally the ball went in. His arms sprang up in the air, and he shouted, I won. I won. He had scored. His team escorted him off the court. The clock ticked down, and the game was over. That day, an undefeated team retained their perfect record. 
but everybody won. Everybody. Every person. Without exception. Is valuable. In the eyes. Of our blessed creator. We parents and grandparents get this, don't we? Did you know that my daughter Jenna is expecting our second grandchild? I do not know the child's gender, but I already love him, her. (laughs) He, she has done nothing for me, not brought me coffee, not called me papa, not done anything, but I already love him, her. There's nothing I wouldn't do for him, her. And that is not hyperbole. Why? Because he, she has a tiny bit of me within him, her. Not much, I know that. But just a tiny bit. And because of who he, she is, I cherish the child already. God loves you with an inexpressible and inextinguishable love. Why? Not because of what you have done, but because of who, because of whose you are. You were made in the image of God. Someone called you a failure? Wrong. Someone wrote you off as a lost cause? Wrong. Someone told you that you outsend the love of God? Wrong. Someone told you that you're not worthy to be a human being? You let them take that lie back to hell where it came. Because of the truth of the matter is, you were made by God. You are loved by God. And that promise has not been rescinded. And that plan has not changed. Heavenly Father, grant please that we could receive this truth down deep in our heart. And that this truth would offset the mistreatment, the abuse, the neglect, the anger, the hostility, whatever we've endured that would dare to suggest to us that we're anything but your masterpieces. And Father, we pray that you would help us to see people the way you see people, as cherished children of God, who, like all of us, are struggling to find their way. Grant that we can treat every human being with dignity, and respect. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. Amen.